Welcome back everyone to episode, I believe it's 12, to you know the last of Europe, I'm your host, Mr. Streets of Rage Lover, or the Guangdong Rai Lover, but oh look, Indonesian government for the national salvation of unity, but regardless of what those Indonesian people are doing, the riots are uh, widespread, the anger is rising, we have 18% control of the situation, and basically we're trying to lower, uh, basically, uh, my goal for this, and to see what happens, because I know some of you guys have put in the comments, is to dis decrease the size of the riots while potentially increasing the radicalism, which isn't something we want, but uh, we'll see. Uh, the strength is 37%, radicalism is 20, almost 30%, uh, the CCL is 45%, it's 35%, and also we come down here like we saw in the last episode, I've already started doing this. Um, we started to lower the control the riders have. My goal is to get this as diminished as possible so it flips blue, so we can reduce the strength, radicalism, government despair, Japanese frustration, more stability and daily political power, which would be good. But it's going to take time. But the market moves on. Hitachi shares fell by 8% in the morning session. Market sources are telling us that sell orders are continuing to come in, arguing, uh, auguring further weakness in the afternoon session. It's nice to hear about somebody else's problems for a change, Morita said. A smug smile on his face from ear to ear as he turned the Sony radio on his desk without a clink or click. Stanley reassured me that the Canton session funds assets are frozen, Lee reported, lowering himself into the chair opposite Morita. He'll make sure friendly faces are lined up when they're auctioned off. Good, Morita nodded as he cleared away the mountains of pain. A paper on his desk into a waiting bin for accepting the offered bin binder from Lee. I get back to my other job, the one you've been covering for me. We just spent the next half hour in gross and work, reviewing files and the open issues within, sorting them into the appropriate piles to be whisked away back to the relevant bureaucratic offices. A silent rhythm settled in the chief executive's office, a calm that Lee had missed dearly over the past several weeks. You know, Lee ventured, what's stopping you, another one of our rivals, from trying this again? They can try, Marita replied, but after we made an example, come on. I think they won't be so eager to follow in his footsteps. Lee nodded. Grateful to see Marita back in his element. We're going to walk the talk. So now we have the options. Listen to the street. We can reduce riot or, uh, strength and radicalism at the expense of Japanese frustration. Or discontent is no issue. Which I kind of want to do the listen to the streets. So it does increase radicalism, but it does decrease Japanese frustration. So we can pass out the Japanese, right? The overwhelming ethnicities of our nation, the Chinese and Zhujin, have united in rally to get to the great crimes done against them by Hitachi. We sided with the people before and taken their concerns as a solution previously. We must do so again now so when everything is on the table. So also, we want to make sure that we don't piss off the Japanese too much or they will coup us, which according to one of your comments says, um, that might be okay. Uh, so, that, or well, maybe not okay, it's not okay to get coup, but they do have a unique, unique focus tree as well, so. And in the meantime, strength and radicalism is going to increase in about a week, which sucks, but warm summers. Those dudes, Marita thundered. His voice carrying across the room, Hitachi sent this whole country to a brink of ruin, and for what? Marita paced. Eyes darting among his cabinet. Was it because Komai thought we weren't harsh enough? Marita asked rhetorically. Did he think a few more cracked skulls and broken bones were what Guangdong needed to skim a few more yen off the bottom line? Marita turned to his cabinet. Komai and his pack of selfish past may wish to destroy us, but I'll assume they dropped dead before I gave them an inch of satisfaction. Omori was the first to speak, idly glancing at the reports in his hand. Sir, we cannot merely negotiate. The people are well past the point where they can be reasoned. I am aware, Commissioner, Morita snapped. Do you take me for a fool? The silence was his answer. As Yei swept across the room, anyone else? Both Nanjing and Tokyo are already taking note. Matsushita's mild-mannered voice quickly grasped Morita's attention. We all know China does not like a presence. It may be worth reviewing the Republic's role in our present situation. That's ridiculous, Lee cut in. What possible reason could Nanjing have for such provocation amid our current situation? A crisis. Marita's deputy affects Matsushita with a glare. My countrymen are not idiots, Matsushita, and for that matter, neither am I. Are you sure you're on our side? Are you questioning my loyalty, Lee? I'm questioning your motives, Matsushita. What with your bottom line and your... I'm perfectly loyal, Matsushita snapped back. Perhaps it should be you who... Enough, Morita thundered. We don't have enough time for bickering. Guangdong is burning, and I will not be content to rule over a nation of ash. But we're trying to... Re we're increasing the radicalism and government despair a little bit. But help re just reduce their strength as much as possible. We'll see if that's worth worthwhile. Okay, so now they're at 38%. These guys are up here. Inspect enter commerce. Decrease the GFT strength by 4%, but increases radicalism. Uh, which isn't great. Increases government despair by a lot. Uh, where are we at? So we have 20% concerns are rising. They're not good. Their anger is rising. The riders are numerous. We're going to demantle their strength as much as possible. And we come down here. 62 is not bad. I don't want any more corruption, though. Get more government support is good, but I really don't want any more corruption. But hot tempers. The climate control, the chief executive's office, was no match for the tempers of the oil crisis. The tensions uh, sat acknowledged in the boardroom, and the tycoons and the chief executive at one end, and Komai at the other like a prowling shark waiting its prey. I apologize for nothing, Komai spat, betraying nothing as he stared down the table. I for I cannot apologize for the incompetence of others sitting at this table. Who's incompetence, Komai? Ibuka's face was a mess, class in, in expression. It doesn't matter, this government quite clearly has no control over the situation at hand, Komai answered evenly. Until the situation changes, I cannot in conscience allow Hitachi to continue adhering to the directors from his office. Outrageously thundered the authority of the chief executive. 
does not extend to the five companies Kumai finished. Our differ deference has merely been a matter of custom, not law. Law or not legal, there. Guangdong is not your plaything, Kumai, and if you think this government will tolerate your flouting of, tolerate Kumai sneer? I see you're under the impression that you have a choice. The IJA clearly doesn't take any orders from the Chinese. The attached executive turned on his heels, storming out of the room. Murdy was silent, eyes fixated on the man's former seat. The worst thing about Komai when he's like this, Ibuk aside, is he isn't always wrong. He'll look to the chief executive. He's untouchable. The garrison will rally to him should have to. You must tread carefully. Duly noted. And now it's back to 40 percentage, probably. 40 and a half. Crap. We're getting more radical. We're at 24. Concerns are rising. Anchors rising. Right. The riots are actually not as bad as we would think. Strength and unity. Also, if this is all poorly done and uh, we're not doing it right, we'll see. <coughs> I guess concerns are... Uh, oh, Japanese frustration remains minimal. The feeling that Chi Lung's heavy boots and worn down jacket felt strange without his tools, the belts of webbing and metal instruments now that were vital on the job, but he supposed he wasn't on the job now, none of them were. Brother Chun turned to Wai, who gazed at him expectantly. You weren't going to work. It wasn't a question. There's only one place to go if you weren't heading to work. He nodded. Keep, hey, safe, Why? It'll be okay. I'll be fine. Why not? Not quite believing his words, not quite ready to object. Chun felt his heart pang. She'd grown up so fast. Stay safe, big brother. I will, why? I will. The Koshu sun beat upon them mercilessly. The banner of the Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen carrying high, carried high on the streets. The workers and laborers of the city marched defiantly behind. The word tradesmen and craftsmen, steel workers and longshoremen, teamsters and shopkeepers. Signs and placards waved defiantly. Slogans and profanity to yell in equal measure. Boom through the megaphone carried by the crowd. Staying at the center of the teeming mass of humanity. Chun felt proud, proud of his adoptive home, of his adoptive city, whether Zhujin or Chinese, factory worker or shopkeeper. Even a few bureaucrats broke past the police cordon and joined the march as they moved past the government's quarters. Koshu would not forget the Hitachi massacre. Chun could only help the administrators and officials watch from the tinted windows and behind the black cloth the police cordons wouldn't either, united in anger. Riots are a little bit less widespread. So, decreases rioter strength increase by 1.5% for 150 days. We lose, we're going to lose a lot of growth. Decrease radicalism, increase the Japanese frustration, lose seats, which I don't like, and government control. Oof. Hmm. Decrease strength, decrease Japanese expat support, and really hurts quality and interest for the next product. Um, I really don't want to do this one, but I do like that it does increase rider strength increase. Some of the more reckless corporate leaders have been keen to call for a blank, blanket clampdown on the dissent which has emerged. Following this course, they've actually no doubt be misguided. The grievances of the people must be aired after all. Their outrage against Hitachi disaster is perfectly understandable. We cannot push too hard against them or else they will snap and turn a rage from Hitachi to us. Daylight protest, nighttime terror. Lamb quietly observed the protest march from his post. The desperate masses of the city marching past. He checked the time, half past six, sometime before nightfall. <coughs> Nodding his replacement, some poor fresh faced cadet, he headed back down, ducking to avoid the relentless midday sun. Lamb! He turned to the noise. Miss Yasukawa, he glanced at the police court, and you should be here. I'm here for a story, officer, Yoshiko replied evenly. Not now, Yoshiko, Lamb said sternly or firmly. It's not safe out here. You need to get the same place. Yoshiko glanced at the protest march, the seemingly unending stream of Guangdong's in class. Things seem to be perfectly fine out here. Yeah, but things change after dark. When the radicals radicals come out, he glanced at the clock once more. Now, come on. We can't leave you out here. He checked the clock as he grabbed his helmet and ballistic goggles, glancing at the corkboard. Could smell the scent of sweat and lubricant. His fellow officers lay sprawled against a seemingly every chair and flat surface, sleeping in a rustless fits, sustained off of coffee, stomach acid, and whatever else sustenance the mess was serving tonight. While the committee of the Federation would be out tonight, the meaner, leaner breed that had no hesitation when going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the local police, as he reminded himself, these weren't the daylight protesters and organizers, the ones who listed sympathy amongst even the most hardline officers. No, they knew all what was at stake. All of them could see the blinking lights of the IJA's garrison settled into the old British Army barracks, hearing the horror stories from Manchuria and Indonesia. Lamb heard the whistle blowing, the call for reinforcements, his shift, and so into the night they went, and hence hindsight, and what comes next. I warned you, Ibuka, Matsushita said, a hint of acidity in his voice, as he offered Ibuka a glass of whiskey. If you keep it close, I'm Komai, who's going to go rogue, from the hostage disaster, and now this. Spare me the sanctimony, oh, Ibuka shot back, taking the glass without turning an eye towards Matsushita. As no use worrying what's over, what, what has happened. Ibuka wasn't arguing the point, only changing the subject. It was the most Ibuka could, we could see to having been wrong in inviting Hitachi into Guangdong all those years ago. The two men raised their glasses at the deserted bar, twenty stores up, their suits hanging heavily from their shoulders with the weight of the accumulated years. They watched the flickering lights of the police checkpoints dotted uh, the desert street, and far from the familiar intoxicated rush of power, they felt the dark spaces between Koshu's lights threatening to swallow them whole. You've been with Marita a long time, Ibuka asked rhetorically. Don't you ever feel the urge to work for yourself again, like how things were under Suzuki? Out of this coma business, Matsushita laughed, a single hollow bark that hung in the room. This is Murray's world, Ibuka. We're just living in it. Suit yourself, Ibuka turned back to his drink with a satisfied grunt. But even if all Guangdong is fine with Murray's vision of mediocrity, and it pains me to admit it that maybe it is, I won't turn my back on mine. 
Mirna will make a mistake, and it'll be my turn. Hey. Increased radicalism. It's only 10 political power. Anger's rising. Oh, we can come over here, too. Do we do want to focus on both? I want to focus on increase their strength as much as possible, but... That just eats up so much political power. Ah, issue per protest permits. Increase the government supply. Ah, oh, we don't really want that one. Decrease government despair. Decrease strength. Oh, this might not be bad to do. Adjust the GTF workplaces. Strength. Japan is observing the crisis. Concerns are rising. Speak to the Consul General. Ah. We get closer and closer, so we can lower the negative effects here. That'd be good. Then again, I could be doing this completely wrong. And by the and about the leadership. Are the course of the riots that have come in, in the wake of the oil crisis? Two major factions have emerged which lead the rioters the Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen and the Committee of Chinese Labor. The leadership of both organizations will be invited to meet with the Chief Executive and Chief Secretary. We must hope that they are willing to cooperate with us or else the situation will continue to spiral downwards. Nighttime rebellion. The perimeter around the city's buildings and offices have steadily been shrinking over the night. The crowd was relentless, hurling Zadan of cocktails and expletives against a cordon of black cloth metropolitan police and their scant provincial reinforcements in equal measure. Ah, nice. The usual insults, traitor, collaborator, lackey, were hurled, but far more concerning were the slogans, driven by the demands of corporate dismantlement, of Japanese expulsion, of labor unionism, of unification with the northern countrymen. The crowd pushed a cordon ever closer to the buildings they protected and the people inside. As the police held the ground outside the government district, Shokan burn. Vindictive workers and angry laborers crashed into their unguarded workplaces, burning records, torching papers, and smashing the machine tools in which they had spent so many hours. There was nothing to stand in their way. The buildings of the industrial district soon lay ablaze in a dozen towering funeral t pyres. The sun rose over a deserted city, and the police strode forth from this redoubt, reinforced over, overnight. I said about scouring for any troublemakers for unfortunate enough to be left behind. There was one phrase that seemed inescapable. Gra graffiti onto the signposts, walls, and on the streets. Dignity is a right, not a privilege. So much for the product cycle. The centers are furious. But as long as the size gets smaller and smaller, that's what matters, right? Uh, to increase radicalism. So 31, 35. What if we let this one go and just focus on here? Because we need to keep our political power as much as possible. Um, government despair. Concerns are rising. Japan's getting more and more interested. Increase the Japanese expat support. Uh, strength. You know, we're going to focus on these guys first. Failure under review. <coughs> Kamala Kenichiro paced agitatedly in his darkened office, uh, tethered to his desk by a taut telephone cord stretching above a wooden surface dust with a cigarette ash. He shut himself in the room ever since returning from the Legislative Council, having instructed his secretary to accept no visitors. Bankers, CEOs, respectable, respectable men, the list of people who had contributed to the scheme to take over Sony was long, and Komai called them all to explain and to apologize. Hitachi's expansion to the Guangdong had begun with the promises of riches and power, and they demanded reassurance that he was still good for his word. Many accepted Kamai's deep regrets after a show of indignation, the twin shackles of obligation and leverage weighing heavier than in their anger. A few, moment, a few more recent opportunistic partners were less restrained in their response to these. Kamai apologized profusely until they were elected, all the while con contemplating his future retaliation. He had taken all his calls while seated, as a superior dictating terms, but the next call was another matter entirely. An international caught at sinking, but even Kamai had his superiors. Of course we'll contest the asset freeze, Kamai said, sweat trickling down his brow. Our men are looking down any assets that the police couldn't seize. The executive board is not so generous to throw good money after bad in Guangdong. The voice on the other end of the line was icy, sending a chill down uh, through Komai's spine. Have you been the, even half uh, the businessman we thought you were? There would have been no need for underhanded tricks. To that, Komai had to answer, even as he felt the earth shift beneath him. The board will review your performance. Komai and Manchuria's fraudulent scheme has failed. Marita has regained his trust in his eyes in the let go. Cool. The outburst in Koshu. The front lines. Oh, crap. Between the police and protesters met. They swallowed the crowd. Pushing those at the front were a mere inches away from the solid shield of the authorities. One protester, a young man missing fingers from an industrial accident, drew too close to the shield wall and took a baton to the temple. He crumpled to the ground like a broken doll, dragged back by his fellows as others retaliated against the aggressor. 
One officer received a mighty strike from the makeshift bamboo pike, staggering away from the melee with a face covered in blood. Another fell and was dragged to the furious crowd, blows landing on him from all directions. A trio of officers braved the crowd and retrieved the comrade, shoving back protesters as they did. Rocks began to fall like rain on the police, most bouncing harmlessly off raised shields or padded helmets. Well aimed and large projectiles took their toll, however, uh, further splattered on the asphalt street with blood. Return to your home. This is an illegal demonstration, and any remaining on the street will be arrested, boomed the police loudspeakers, repeating the command in the hopes that the repetition would draw compliance. The fighting went on, though. Power to the people, justice for the workers, lapdogs, scum, cowards, bullies, fight like men, blared the back num numerous megaphones from the protesters. The resulting deal was enough to drive anyone into distraction as a verbal war rage, gunfire, the live rounds demanding acqui acquiescence, broke through the cacophony and sent the protesters fleeing from the police lines. Dozens slumped away, broken bones and dripping blood, their, metal their medals for the day. I don't want to do this one. But we're going to do whatever it takes to lower the uh, rider strength in at least one time at a one place at a time. Also, right now, uh, we don't need the process. Equals of Guangdong. 71% uh, so not bad. 70, this one, uh, honestly, if we could, I'm going to lower our, I'm going to lower that just a little bit because we don't need more political power. Counter the propaganda. Increase the strength, though. 41. Holy crap. How are we supposed to be able to do this? This is impossible. I want to lower their strength, but this is, this hurts us so much. Decrease strength by 6%. That's kind of radical, don't you think? Government spares at least 60. Let them vent. Daytime in Macau. It was noon in the place called Elmin, and the people had awoken. Uh, the two protesters, one Chinese and one Zhujin, marched in the midday heat as a brain beat down uh, on their heads. The heat might have dissuaded them from carrying on the work where they called uh, climbs. It might equally have demotivated them if they were not protesting for the rights. Yeah, that was not the case. It was time for the people of occupied Guangdong to rise and make clear that they neither Japanese imperialism nor the rule of Sony Corporation had cowed them. The energy of the fellow protesters has sustained them through the heat and humidity as they marched through the concrete Macau jungle. Suddenly, however, a problem emerged. A police barricade, one of several on the way to the Macau government complex, their eventual destination. The protesters looked at one another. Would they have to stop or take a detour? Might the police force break them down? Might... Wait a moment. What was that? Were the police clearing the barricades? They were. The crowd roared. The police pulled back. The barricades dismantled. The crowd roared as they passed through the once blocked off zone. These cops were treating them with kid gloves. They were clearly reluctant to double down on their old mistakes. All the better for the protesters. That meant they were all the free to force Guangdong to listen to them. The power that freedom gave them was intoxicating. I kind of want to do this one to just destroy their strength if possible. They're going to be furious, but all gone. Yamauchi Hiroshi. <clears throat> I learned nervously on the metal railings of a purchase shop at the Nintendo factory, gazing upon the workers at their stations, crafting and assembling Nintendo products. There used to be more here, he thought to himself, counting the number of workers on the ground and glancing at the full list of employees in the clipboard he held in his hands. The symphony of the machinery that once amazed him was nothing but a quiet whimper, as the sound of thick sheets, uh, paper sheets being cut into cards barely even reaching him anymore. The men, women, and Chinese and Japanese that once worked so harmoniously with each other were no longer there, the workstations collecting dust. Yamachi sighed. A modest man clad in blue, different to the white most workers wore, approached him. Uh, the sound of his boots on the metal railing, drowning up the already soft hum of the machinery. Good morning, Mr. Yamachi, the man greeted, extending his hand. Ah, oh, you must be the supervisor. Yamachi replied, shaking his hand. Where have all the workers gone? There's barely even a skeleton crew here. We're not even meeting the minimum daily output anymore. Yamachi pointed to the noticeably factory floor below them. Well, I don't really know either, sir. The supervisor solemnly nodded. One day it was one worker gone, the next it was five. By the end of the week, half the staff just stopped showing up. I tried to pry it any around to see what happened, but no one wants to tell me anything. He scoffed nervously, taking off his hard hat. Yamachi quickly ran through his list on the clipboard to see how many unions affiliated employees were gone. The union, they must be behind this. God, can they, ever be, they can never be satisfied. He thought to himself, the union. Have you checked with them? Are they striking? Yamachi snapped, putting it down the clipboard. Well, like I said, sir, no one is telling me anything. But I think this is a union thing. If they were, they would have left all at the same time and made demands already. Something bigger is brewing. The superior replied, glancing at the floor below him. What's happening in the city anymore? And snapped factory inspections. As this discontent spreads among the workers, it's important that we remind them that we have always been and will remain on their side. Using the mounting tensions caused by the riots as their justification, staff inspections will be ordered for the factories across Guangdong to ensure that the existing policies, which we so vigorously champion, are enforced. Increase more strength. Um, how do we get to de negotiate? 450 billion? Increase frustration, but it lowers our despair. You might need to do that when you lower despair. Let's do both these. Two 
engineering companies are nice. Don't really need them, honestly, for now. Especially attack helicopters, but whatever. Growth, 4%, whatever. Who's officer plus? Increase government despair. Increase radicalism, but increase their strength. I just want to destroy their strength. 41% dismantle. At most, the strength is 25%. Oh. Spending a bunch of money, but okay. Launch an investigation of the Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen and try to dismantle their organizations. Well, let's save and try that one out. We'll see what we can do with the uh, good old people, the Green Union, and see if we can dismantle them first. I don't know. We have almost 800,000 manpower, though, which is pretty decent. But we still don't have enough electricity for us, or grid power. All the King's Bem. Smug little dude, ain't he? Remarked one of the many huddled detectives around the briefing room's row of CRT monitors. And the trembling static hands like the flickering visage of the same man on the news feeds and in the surveillance footage. The protester leader stood, flanked by the scores of his comrades. <laughs> I'd be smug too if I got to spew this all day without getting kicked swiftly downtown, said the chief investigator. Judging by his little stand-up act on the KHK, that's exactly what college boy over here thinks. Nonviolent civil disobedience to my butt, but we know better. Do we sir ask a voice from the back of the room? We still got nothing that'll stick. No trace of movements, just associates and dubious links. So probe the effing associates then, smart buddy, replied the chief. Do you think I called you in for pep tech? The man keeps his movement guarded well, but he's got a big entourage, and we have a list of their names right here. The chief held up the list from the pile of photocopies. One of them's about to squeal. He turned to the man who had under interrupted him, and for the sake of your badge, they better. So dismantle. He's be willing to negotiate. Japanese frustration. So where are we at now? Ooh, they're furious. Okay, yeah, and dismantling them. Effect in 13 days. The GFT must be kept weak in order to try to successfully dismantle them. To continue dismantlement, their strength must be under 30%. Oh, crap. Hey, there you go. It's looking better now. That should give us, ooh, even more political power to work with. Good cop, bad cop. 33 years old, uh, management, lower management position within a medium-sized corporation. Single, member of the Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen. Sedition is cretin. cretin. Can the monotone voice of the interrogating officer? Tell me, did I get anything wrong here? I've already given all the information I am legally required to. I refuse to make any further comments without the presence of an attorney. I know my rights, said the prisoner. A soft shackle came from the other side of the table. Right, Snow, sir. You know what you, you used to be your privileges. They don't exist anymore now. What my colleague is trying to say, sir, said the other policeman across from the prisoner, is that it is in your best interest to cooperate with us. You are a known confidant of one of the most dangerous men in Guangdong, and by this, I do not mean dangerous to the police. When these fires die down, all those close to them will be spending a very long time in a very cold cell. Or maybe a very short time followed by a seat in a very hot chair, said the first policeman. Precisely, said the second officer, but while I'm sure my colleague would love that, I still see the possibility of a second chance for you. The choice is simple. It's within our power to ensure that you are protected, perhaps even rewarded. I would like that, I really would, but I haven't seen anything from you that would let me do that. My friend would love to throw you the, throw the book at you. So do, so do it then, said the prisoner. Book me, get my lawyer, or screw off. The choice is simple. Book him. At a certain end, we might get something. He needs time to think. This is a waste of time. Hmm. We might get something out of him, yeah. The demands of the people. After a while, it became impossible to ignore. No matter how hard one tried, every street in Hong Kong had a poster on it. They were on the fronts of the buildings, gates, telephone poles, cars, anything and then everything that could possibly be covered by them. They were a white allergy that coated, coated the entire city in forward slogans. You couldn't close your eyes before it either. Those same slogans on the posters were shouted at full volume in the innumerable protests and marches that were on seemingly every hour. Even if you were in all tall buildings, like Marita Keo was, the whole noise was very much still audible. Then there was the violence. Every single day, the chief executive received lurid reports, a detail in the clashes between the police and protesters. It took long before he realized that the riots were taking a serious toll on Guangdong. And the objective was to make their demands clear if he thought they'd done their job. Some time had passed since the riots began, but, uh, enough to consider carefully whether it was worth responding to them or not. It was certainly worth at least thinking about, the chief executive thought, since more than enough blood has already been shed already. The riots were disabled in Guangdong by the second, if talking to the protesters could help bring an end to all this, then, well, why not? On the other hand, negotiations and negotiating and failing would be even worse. Uh, broken problems would even be worse than making no promise at all. And there would be no telling how the lead court is still worse. Japan would react if the word got out that they were talking to the radicals. Okay, I'll thought, gave it some more thought. A difficult decision looms. The Guangdong of Federation of Tradesmen and the Committee of Chinese Labor are prepared to negotiate with the government. They better. 21%, nice. To reassure investors, huh?
stick carrot. Your co cooperation will be rewarded, the chief began, eyes fixed on the suspect. However, if you choose not to do so, you won't see the outset of a jail cell for a very long time. He said short reaction, any hint of compliance, any sign of submission, he found none, though. The prospective officer worker stared at the chief. Defiance was evident in his face. A uh, mirthless laugh filled the concrete room. Truly, this cannot be the best the GPF has to offer. He looked down at the table. Have you no mind what risk I have already taken by joining the supposed subversive organization? He removed his spectacles, staring down at the officer, eyes burning like lasers. Do your worst, luck. I would not give nothing up. The chief reclined in his chair, glancing over at his companion. His fingers tapped on the table. Hopes of an easy breakthrough to get Dash. Called the department and sent for an enhanced investigator. Let him steal. We'll find another patch. We'll see. Maybe it's a complete waste of time, and then we'll go back. Growing. We're losing regret. The descenders are furious. Under the radar, the office buildings of Central Koshu were deserted after sundown, and Wong Si Wai scanned the darkened alleyways and scattered vehicles for any sign of undercover police. An unnaturally slow-moving vehicle or an seemingly less, uh, listless man on an errant bench. It still seemed unreal that he'd been left through the specif specified uh, police checkpoint, simply handed by, uh, handing them the note that he had received a few days earlier. It was clearly out of place. His factory overalls wholly unnatural where tailored suits were the norm, and the riots had made much inner of Intercoshu a no-go zone for the leaders of the Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen. <laughs> he was allowed into the specified office block without harassment, escorted to a nondescript conference room by two suited men with Matsushita lapel pins. When the door opened, there was no waiting police interrogation, only the graying figure of the Matsushita Masaharu, and nobody else. Hope you've seen that we're good for your word. For our word, Matsushita quipped, standing and offering his hand, despite everything, the government is willing to talk. I see, Wong replied naturally, neutrally, touching Matsushita's hand only for a second. We're hoping to see the chief executive or the chief secretary. And you still might, Matsushita countered, wiping his hands on the trousers if there's a unified position that I can bring to them. And what happens if there's still no such unified position? Wong stared down Matsushita across the table, as both men stood in the flickering fluorescent glow of the ceiling light. Matsushita narrowed his eyes, but eventually relented, his taking a seat and motioning for Wong to do the same. Then we'll continue meeting until you have one. Discreet inquiries. There was one subject in the riots that everyone around Chief Executive Morita Akeo had steadfastly refused to a voice aloud, even if everyone had thought it more than possible. The Republic of China, never friendly to Guangdong's existence, had kept its public statements limited to calling for the protection of Chinese citizens in Guangdong. The staff had been a thorn in the side of the government, claiming consular privileges over Chinese nationals, gumming up the investigation seemingly at random. And what if the invention, interventions by the Chinese weren't random? What if, in addition to the consular assistance, the Chinese had decided to vent their displeasure with Guangdong through other more active interference? Their motives and opportunity were present, all that remained were the means. Quietly, the police made as many safe, deniable quarries as they could concern in the consulate's uh, recent activities. They wouldn't take the first step into the diplomatic mind for that would surely result from a full investigation, but it would be negligent to not lay the foundations ahead of time. What are the Chinese up to? The government has the option to investigate the Chinese Consulate General's role in the Guangdong riots within the decision category, of course, an investigation into something as close to may have severe consequences if mishandled. Oh, crap. Investigate him. Begins an effort to undercover whether or not the Chinese are aiding the rioters and still how deep their sport goes. If we suspect the Republic of China of interfering in the riots, maybe with invest investigating the Consulate General, but there will be severe consequences if we're, if we're wrong. Perfects in eight days. We can try it. I don't know how well it's going to be. We can speak to them. Give us more time. Streets of Rage. Yeah. Oh, we're getting closer. Look at that. A coin toss. Another cold morning at dawn over Guangdong, nestling his head in the neck of his police jacket, Sato Atushi attempted to stave off the harsh, biting winds of the Guangzhou winds a little to no avail. Casting jagged silhouettes under the bluish gray sky, ships and freighters of all sizes and shapes lazily drifted in and out of the port. The skyscrapers opposite Sato saw the colo colossal neon signs on with print bricks of light dotting their faces, with each window holding their own story and dramas exclusive to the people inside. To the salary men of Hot Sonia Hotachi, the worries about pay raises or promotions must have seemed like the most urgent thing in the world. How lucky they were. Sergeant, the voice spoke out from behind him. We have a leader, rather, too. Turning around, a fresh face of policemen or police officer greeted him, his baggy uniform too large to fit onto the boy. In his hand, there was a torn up piece of paper. Sato grabbed the paper and dismissed the boy. He knew that the grunts were angry young men. He had hoped that the emphasis was on angry, not young in that phrase, no matter the case. Brought in two suspects in the case, or don't read, municipal worker and shopkeeper, related to lieutenant. Intelligence, not sure how exactly, but a good profile lieutenant. Need you at station immediately. We can break these two and get them to spill the guts. Uh, Biao, P.S. Why do you keep disappearing so often? Related to the lieutenant. The intel here was shaky to be cordial, but if they were navigating a Crete in a labyrinth without a ball of string, if I remember this class was correctly, but if they were related, then they were the only leads they had. But even if they didn't manage to crack the lieutenant, it wouldn't matter if it was all too late. Whoever was behind this was smart, smart fast. They were consistently making themselves unpredictable and hard to track. If they didn't get something soon, they might as well have never tried, but normal's not enough. 
Just as we thought the situation could, get, could not get any worse, it did. We expected the riots to slowly dissipate as time went by, but it seems the reverse is true, that the riots both grow in strength and radicalism for each passing day. The situation has gone far from what we call normal, and it has to be sorted out quickly and returned to normalcy. As priorly stated, the normal effect that we effort we put into containment is no longer adequate. In order to sort the situation as rapidly as possible, more state resources must be focused and in taking control of the situation, more police security and riot control must be unleashed to put down the riot. We'll be willing to take far more drastic measures to stop the riots at any cost. We do what we must. Yeah, we're just going to stay on these guys for now. Japanese concerns are growing. We're not supposed to negotiate, we're supposed to dismantle them. A room without a view. Control, reconfirm address. Apartment 418-273 Wang Jing Wai Road. You have this room writing? Is, this an, is there an issue? We're there, a place is vacant. Has been for some time, your guy lied to us. Has the location been thoroughly examined? All potential hiding places look through? That's a crappy apartment, not here. Himeji Castle? Unless we're being led by dust mites, we're wasting our time here. One moment, the radio went silent for several moments. We return to precinct immediately. Suspect will be uh, subject to further questioning. Caught for that control tail interrogation. Interrogation put the screws in properly this time. For your eyes only. One more day. Dang it, nothing else here yet. God dang it, we're so close. Wait for the Chinese now. In the dim of the sunset, Chief Executive Morita Akeo furtively selected a nondescript folder from the stack upon his desk, unassuming in every form but for a single deliberate scribble at the bottom left corner, or top left corner, I should say. There's no shortage of police documentation revealed these days, and while that provided sufficient cover for the folder in question, he didn't ensure this folder didn't end up in the wrong hands. The reason was immediately clear from the first line of the closed text. Recommendations for observation, Consul General of the Republic of China for the Chief Executive's eyes only. Even reading two, those two lines enough was to make Morita Akeo's eyes shoot to the door, and then the windows, for fear of prying eyes. Suspicion about the Chinese government's role in the riots was commonplace, yet less common was for said suspicion to be voiced, let alone put on paper. After a deep breath to Eddie's hand, Marita Akeo's eyes slipped through the memorandum, absorbing its contents as quickly as he dared. There were several avenues for investigation, scoping out the motivations and official communications from the Consulate General, finding material evidence of the support for the Committee of the Chinese Labor, or building a profile around Consulate General Song Ziguang and political attaché Wang Zhizhu. If the Chinese truly were stirring up the pile in Guangdong, then there would be, have to be some show to follow. And if the Chinese were involved, and they may have caught the chief executive prior to the diplomatic affairs, there should be hell to pay. We must investigate the communications to expose their involvement. Any material links to the CCL. Put a profile on Consul General Wang and Natasha Wang. The more we know about both, the easier we can expose them. It's too risky to burn the files. We'll go with this one. I like this one. Because we did get some stuff about them earlier. Hey, advancements in power technology, or power efficiency technology, sign us up. Nice. Suicide is painless. The chief, uh, police, the police chief, looked ahead, his eyes gazing slowly downwards. He let out a small breath. How did this happen? The bloody mess which gazed upon the slab gave no response. Instead, the mortician next to the captain raised his eyes to the clipboard. The disease appears to have been the target of severe blunt force trauma, and multiple lesions and lacerations are found across the body, which may have contributed to the death, uh, the cause of death. However, yes. The mortician raised the right wrist of the chief, to whom it resembled little but pancake layers of dry blood, and incision across the main artery, caused uh, a fatal blood loss, likely made with an improvised blade of some sort, though we have been unable to recover the weapon. Likely the cause of the fellow inmates, so whether this was a murder or euthanasia is unclear. So saying we couldn't catch you did it? The whole block's being interrogated, but it'll take time. Chief put a hand to his head, I can see. Get that thing out of here. Discreetly, said the mortician, it won't matter, they already know. Increases strength. I don't want to increase Japanese frustration anymore now. Let's go do those three. The prime suspects. Mm. Decrease strength. One percent. Decrease CCL strength. Expat support. I'll do that one too. Why not? Even as the work of building the general case against the Chinese government and its agencies or agents in Guangdong was entrusted to the police, Chief Executive Marita Kao's thoughts wandered back to the two men who were willing to pull the strings, Consul General Zhang Zhiguang and Wang Jingwu. The team had been known a quantity in Guangdong for years. Song is the representative of the Chinese government, and Wang is an attaché directing the Chinese intelligence operations in Guangdong. They are too enmeshed in Guangdong to refusably claim ignorance of any subversive activity, but linking them conclusively to said activity will be a difficult issue altogether. It struck Morita Akeo that he, perhaps unique among the members of the Guangdong's government and the tycoons of the four companies, had a perspective that the two men formed over the years of interactions. If nothing else, those perspectives could be useful for the police to build a profile of Consul General Song and Attaché Wang. 
I can hardly do so now at any rate. Give me the file and more. The more you find attaching one, the larger chance to find something of substance. Crap. I'm gonna go with what song. Concrete shoes. Oh, oh crap. Wait, what? You sure it was him? said the man in the dark in the safe house. I pulled him in from the river myself. He's gone, said the woman opposite him. Well, that could be anyone the river must have. Or the torturers. That could have been anyone, but not him. Look at me, she said, holding his face level to hers. I didn't want to admit it either, but he's gone, he's gone. Those stupid dudes, he screamed. I'll rip their having throats. Quiet, she hissed. They're after us. What if someone hears? The man paused, breathing heavily, tears sliding down his face. We can't let him die for nothing. This can't be for nothing. He needs to be avenged. He paused for a moment. People need to know what happened, yes. But more than that, they need to act. They will. Trust me, they will. Bruh. Are you kidding me? Can we negotiate? Diaxie, Song Ziguang. Profile, born in 1916 in the Republic of China. Guangzhou. Educational attainment, bachelor's degree from 1934 to 1951. Degree delayed to the Greater East Asian War, completed after earning diplomatic service. Or entering it. Uh, joined military service of foreign affairs, 1949. Diplomatic history uh, for, from 4952, Republic of China, Nanjing, no title. And he's got various other titles too. Chief Executive Marita Kale. Marveled at the trajectory of Song's career, picked to be the Consul General by 48. Even if it was to be a country, Chano took every pain to snub where it could. Perhaps that had been the point. There's a few threads worth pulling, even in this truncated history. Why well, was he returned to Guangdong in 1962, though? <coughs> what did Song do during the war? Is there anything of note to his previous postings? Oh, crap. Uh. What did he do during the war? In his previous postings. What about that one? Getting a deal. Well, if it ends the riots. That thought entered Marita Kao's mind more than a few times while the entire government scrambled to deal with the worst crisis in Guangdong history. It was initiated of all of just above a whisper, but it grew ever louder as it became increasingly clear that the riots would not magically disappear. It was remarkably tempting. They would have to make some concessions to the protesters, but of course, which could prove troublesome, but hopefully they would only be minor ones, and then all of the chaos would be over and business could return to the normal. It's by the very late hour. Many of the government's highest officials were huddled in the office to discuss the matter. They put on brave faces, though from their sh shoulders and slightly deceptive heads. One could tell they're all exhausted. The chief executive addressed one of them. Get up, go over it again, Igarashi. One more time. Igarashi Masato. The government's designated negotiator strengthened his tie and uh, cleared his throat. Yes, of course. While we begin negotiations, the protesters will expect that we come to some sort of agreement with them. It's absolutely critical that we get this right the first time. We'll probably not get a second chance. Ultimately, the decision up to you, chief executive. Should we begin negotiations? Not now. Be careful, for riders to accept a weak proposal, their radicalism and strength must be low. But the blood code accepts significant concessions, government despair must be high, and Japan's frustration will invariably increase if we grant too many concessions. You can back out for saying your initial proposal. Once your initial proposal is sent, hardly no turning back. If you screw this up, I'm just gonna go ahead and like use not use consequences, but like reload the save. Apologize. First step in changing course, acknowledging fault of now the chief executives and at least Hitachi's individual accountability. It's far too late for an apology to suffice. Much as the Heartlanders and the Legislative Council think otherwise, what's the freedom of a few men before the welfare of many? Restitution. Penance is two things, to acknowledge sin and to make amends. We have the money to spare. Restraining, retraining is social welfare. If it continue or to stop another conflagration from consuming Guangdong in the future, we must make investments in its people today, ranging from offering new training to the civil service and expansions of disability pay and educational allowances. State Ombudsman. If the people no longer trust the government to act in their interests, then we will offer them an ombudsman to act as an observer. But we must demand that our perspective must be considered an independent one. The next step for any ombudsman proposal is to give it an actual rather than nominal independence, with equal representation for the government and dissident activists, activists, affirmative action. In order to preserve any semblance of ethnic concord in Guangdong, we must ensure that the people, whether Zhujin or Chinese, have a real stake of labor to vote in compensation paid in the government bureaucracy and security forces. Rights to unionize. It would be foolish to expect the dissidents to disband after tasting collective power. It's a bitter pill to swallow, but by recognizing the right to reunionize for this dissident group, with the right to escalate concerns of the chief executive, we can better track the political activities going forward. Protective status? The dissident group in question will be granted special status in Guangdong's security and political framework, immune from any threats of disillusion and investigation of its activities without immediate evidence of egregious criminal activity. All action taken during the riots are, of course, are exempt from this definition and privileged assist advocate. Where wrong has been done, action must be taken to make things right. It stands to reason, then, that grievous wrongs demand radical action. The chief executive will pledge to extend privileged advocate status to the dissident group in question, a political dispensation to extend state backing and resources in case where damage is redressed, as a priority ensuring the Zhujin and Chinese can defend themselves in the court system, which is otherwise heavily stacked in favor of the corporations. It's difficult to see anyone doing this. To end the riots by negotiation, we must craft a proposal. With ten possible provisions to add, each one more radical than the last. 
The proposal needs to consider the bargaining power of the chosen writer group through their strength and radicalism, as well as that Aleko is willing to pass based on her government despair. Too many concessions will get on Japan's nerves and lead to heightened tensions with I.J. Garrison. Apologize. Hmm. Tan to add. Individual accountability. Add restitution. What do you do with that one? They all have branch. And the proposal, which we have worked very hard on, is the center of our commitment to the future of Guangdong. We sincerely hope that all of your concerns are addressed. Yes, we come from di very different perspectives, but we both want peace and stability in Guangdong as we begin from that point. I'm confident that we'll eventually come to an agreement. Thank you. The pleasantries. <clears throat> Came and went quickly, since there was no love between the government and the protesters. Chief Negotiator Igarashi Masato had just finished presenting the government's proposal in a cold hotel meeting room and remained standing as he awaited a response. The protesters exchanged whispers between themselves for a few seconds, and their leader stood up. His reply was sure and direct, his tone terse and assertive. While we have some shared interests, we also make sure to review every point of your proposal. Thank you. The protesters to the then gathered in another corner of the meeting room, lowering their voices to prevent from being heard. As their low, indistinct grumbling went on, Igarashi, uh... Igarashi just uh, tried to eavesdrop on the conversation, and managing to grasp snatches of it here and there, fragments that were enough to make him and the rest of the negotiation team swept. I'm telling you, this is nowhere near enough. Very far apart right now. This is more like a document of surrender. This went on for more than a few minutes, though it felt longer, and then the leader stood up again, bringing the current session to an end. We'll need some more time to review your proposal, but we'll be in touch soon. It probably won't pass. 61. Widespread panic, huh? This can't buy tie, huh? Increased radicalism by a huge amount. Reassure investors. Speak to the... Uh, huh. The from foreign shores. It was easy to trace the goings of a diplomat. The expertise, preferences, and political leanings were discernible through long paper trails and foreign postings. It made Zong Ziguang noteworthy, a man who chose to focus on Asia, specializing in public diplomacy and political affairs. It's not entirely surprising given the lack of diplomatic freedom afforded to Nanjing. Curiously, the Consul General's most exotic posting was not the streets of Germania or the avenues of Washington, but Russia, amid the chaos of the West Russian War. A tradition among the diplomatic corps to get fresh diplomat foreign postings to help them grow acclimated. Song, it seemed, had drawn the short stick and amid the competition for foreign postings. Interesting. The itching plague. It was, uh. <clears throat> Quite uh, the quiet night of the barracks, the short ways outside of the heart of the urban chaos, something considered a minor tragedy to those inside. The horizon was not exactly clear. Nothing was coming towards Private Hirano's guard post. Not a sound, not a single darn soul coming to receive punishment. His hands, desperately seeking a solution to their discomfort, wandered over his rival, fingers brushing against his intricately crafted machine of death, fondling the guard at the trigger, but unable to pull it. The order had not come. His hands were not at the end of a flood of bullets. His boots were not nestled deep in the shattered skulls. There was only the sound of disturbed leaves outside and the scratching within. Lights had already come and saw Kota. Continued scraping away with his flashlight. The rest of the barracks did not complain, themselves busy in similar projects. It taken to avoid wearing his eye patch as of late, and so the pale mechanical glow cast into the reddish black pit, where visions looked no more, only an infernal, never ending itch. Ignored it to focus on his task. Supposedly, these rounds were now stable, out of prototyping good. His knife flashed on and on in the limited night, carving names of previous hells, of which the chief executive had sent them to shoot their barely functioning toy guns. Of the two names of the disgusting masses the chief executive had failed to pacify while they were sent away. All five companies over whose decadence the chief executive resided, and of course several for the Chinese executive instead, just in case he missed. Concluding another uneventful staff meeting, Nagano shook the last man's hand and sat back in his desk. Uh, the unsigned order lingered in front of him, as it always did, soon, soon, but not yet. As he considered packing up leaving for the day, he noticed a continued ghostly sensation in the last man's hand in his, a pervading itch, but one which could not be yet be scratched. Uh, Japan is I.J. Garrison, who is considering if direct measures are needed to quell the riots, and sure they maintain this confidence in your matters may be taken out of your hands. Dasya Song uh, marveled at him. Uh, so maybe that wasn't luck. Why was he posted? Why was he returned? Guangdong Blues. Even amidst a flux and submitted the mark of the early days, uh, the new Guangdong administration. Personal and family records could be traced if one was willing to look. Among the many things that Guangdong lacked, one, Will was not one of them. The immediate family of Song Ji Guang was no longer residing within Guangdong's boundaries, but that in and of itself was hardly room for suspicion. The mass movement of people during the war uprooted families and shattered communities, yet the Consul General had always spoken following the ancestral home. I love that, in his own words, no foreigner immigrant would ever truly understand. The IRA biases of the nativist, perhaps with a family history traceable to at least the 30s. The history in the area with, uh, well predates the oldest chief executive of the most tenured veteran of the IJA Garrison. The man's at a point of towering the three pearls and walking the streets on top of his uh, official duties. Diplomat he may be, but Koshu, Zongzu, as he might say so, but even he walks as a, walks as a foreigner. Interesting. Come on. Yeah, we're going to have to redo this. Snap inspections. 
Wong Hai Fei, sometimes a, a minor bureaucrat and another time a financial inspector within the Guangdong State Police, had decided he wanted a break from the arduous of financial audits and took over a government inspector shift after he took ill. <coughs> Driving to the factory compound of Wan Okuma, a small factory owner he knew for his labor right violations, even after Morita Keo had personally taken him to task in the early days of the regime, he rolled down his window and nodded at Officer Lam, the policeman leading the convoy that escorted him to the factory. Lam nodded back and pointed to forward. The inner gates of the factory compound were barricaded at release. Okuma clearly thought they were. But Lam took one look, snorted, and raised a Sony branded bullhorn to his mouth. Mr. Okuma, as a uh, Guangdong police escorting state inspector Ishida Shintaro to inquire into the conduct of your business, we advise you to immediately dismantle your barricade unless you want us to force an entry and seize any and all pertinent evidence up to and including factory machinery. At that, a loud curse swiftly cut off was heard, and the doors were barricaded and opened in short order. The owner had relented. But now without protest, as it turned out. When Akuma saw Wang, he began to complain. Why aren't you inspecting Hitachi? Don't you know they're violating the labor laws on their face right now? Outwardly, Wang was dismissive. Stop spousing, spouting nonsense, sir. Other people's violations don't free from an enforcement action. But in his heart of hearts, he knew the literal answer to the man's questions. It was because Hitachi had guns and could open fire on the police. Find our allies. Japanese frustration. <coughs> Increase strength even further. Limited coordination. Decrease the strength gain. Eyes of the troublemakers. Raise the black flag. I think I might just do in between here. Government support. Find our allies. Okay. Reduce ride strength. And so whatnot. We should have already been able to dismantle them. That's completely unfair to us already. Like, bruh. Um, remove the limiters. Reduce strength strength and and that, huh? Cause if we can get back Chinese support, if we do this side. Increase Zhujin support as well. It is destroy our seats though. You probably isolate the troublemakers. As we've taken into account on several occasions during the crisis, the protesters are very diverse or device device diversive, diversive. Diverse in the terms of beliefs and goals, most simply wish to express their discontent with the circumstances that they are in. There, there are some uh, are more unsavory than the rest of them. These are the people that don't want to express them, their displeasure, instead of looking to cause anarchy, start trouble, and in general disable the street of Guangdong. They are the people that we cannot be, that cannot, we, we cannot reason with. And treating them in the same way as we treat the rest of all the protesters is simply a mistake. Instead, they must be eliminated from the picture as soon as possible. The police will focus on isolating their influence from spreading, so as not to attract any more people to the cause. Familiar stopping grounds. My God, can we just negotiate with these people? My God, come on. We're not just we're not even trying to negotiate with them. Apparently, uh, familiar stopping grounds. Actually, do we have anything here yet? No. Uh, it wasn't that the consul general was tour touring Guangdong. It was where he toured. He appeared in factories, schools, and markets in Guangdong's many Chinese neighborhoods. When asked, he laughed off concern, stated that he merely been visiting old friends. The consul general seemed to have many old friends, realistically far too many of them for a man who hadn't been home in decades. The answer, of course, lay in location. Many of the places he had toured. Saw unrest during the riots, not all, but certainly enough to arouse some concern. On a map, his uh, visits appeared less like a man during his old home and more like an intelligence officer building his network. Interesting. Desi Song Guang, what did he do during the war? A counteroffer. Can you give us some time to look over this, please? We would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Chief of negotiator Igarashi and his team swiftly assembled on the far side of the room, pulling the chairs close to avoid being heard. After the protesters had rejected their initial proposal, there were fears that they wouldn't return. Instead, a few days later, the protesters' delegation called for another meeting presenting Igarashi with their new list of demands. He looked at the document. There are many pages filled with lengthy explanations of expectations. He'd have time to read those later, but thankfully a bullet appointed summary of their key demands on the front. Apologize. Individual accountability, restitution, retraining in social welfare, and state ombudsman. Uh, when they were finished reviewing the page, one of the older men on the team turned to Igar Igarashi looking for direction. Well, Chief, we have a counteroffer. What should we do? We'll take it. Let's delay. We need more time. They're not taking the negotiation seriously. We'll walk away. We'll take it. That seems more than fine for me. Missing papers. <coughs> the blank spots that mark the Consul General's file from 37 to 48 were hardly unusual. The records of the old Chinese government, those that were burned, destroyed, or shredded by the Qiang's regime, were otherwise less of corruption, chaos, and general, influ general flux. They marked the final years of war in China. Although they did survive, but frequently were left without an update as many materials were consumed in the struggle for the Middle Kingdom. Only the living, both on paper and life, had, given, had their lives go on. <coughs> the Consul General would have been 21 when the Kwantung army crossed the Yongtung River. 
a university education placed on hold, a prime fighting age during the war. Like so many others, his paper trail during those years vanished, reappearing in the records only when the dust had settled. Interesting. We are so close here. A lead. Ooh. <clears throat> there was motive and opportunity. Consul General Song clearly would have liked to have the means to involve himself with the riots and the more subversive elements of Guangdong, yet suspicion and circumstance are not in and of itself make themselves a solid case. One of the Consul General's personal wishes, the proof that he had been interfering in Guangdong's affairs, did not extend further than limited circumstantial evidence. It would be up to the element, other elements of the investigation to make such a case. Back to the basics. <coughs> you find nothing? Investigate Wang Jingwu? Investigate him. Keep him down. Wang Zhang Wu. He's got quite a few stuff here. Familiar connection to the He King Yin as father in law cannot be discounted. Plenty for Chief Executive Morita Kyo to dig into. Starting with military history or investigate connections. I'm going to ask the troublemakers for now. Raise expectations. Or family ties. Despite the wide latitude afforded as his political attaché, Wang is only taking the occasional leave to visit his family in Guangxi. Only on Lunar New Year Eve, or Lunar New Year, did it appear that his contact with Guangxi and He Qin 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 Ying Qin extended beyond the perfunctoriness expected of diplomats, family ties, and Tsai. His wife, however, appeared to have no such reservations visiting Guangdong's neighbor whenever it seemed safe to do so. Records from Koshu Airport show that Wang's wife was far more frequent visitor than Wang himself. Marital issue, homesickness, the possible reasons were many, but also irrelevant. Wang, despite his history and familial ties, seemed to look closer to He Ying King than anyone else. Peculiar. Most important week. Look, do you not understand how important this is? I know it's difficult, but we must pass the bill at any cost. And unless people like you vote for it, Guangdong will collapse. Have you been ready yet? This isn't a deal, considering what we're giving them. It might as well be called the Surrender Act. Guangdong will collapse if we take this so-called deal. Not if we reject it. Hall was just outside the chamber of the Legislative Council where it animated. A buzz of activity, even at such an early hour. Many were holding well-worn paper copies of the proposal in their hands. Most were engrossed in quick-fire conversations about the document's contents. All of them understood the intense pressure on the council to deliver a result. The two main camps emerged. Some were critical, and the attacks came in thick and fast on every giant title, ranging from somewhat skeptical to the company ap completely apoplectic. At the same time, one could just as easily find those who defended the bill as best they could get, and there were numerous passionate advocates who argued for the proposal as if their lives depended on it, which probably did. When the doors come to the chamber open, a few minutes before proceedings began, the legislators filed in without a moment's hesitation, taking their seats without delay. On top of their schedules, four black blocky words vote in ten days. The upcoming vote would be one of the most important in their lives. If not the most important, they'd have to last in two weeks to make their decisions. A barrage of questions were prepared by all lawmakers, ready for the moment the floor was open. There'd be no time to waste. The speakers walked up to the dais, tapped the mic, and said, The bill has now been introduced. The debate may commence. Introduce a compact with the GFT to the Legislative Council. It'll be in ten days instead of thirty. Uh, due to the various proposal and our government spare, we need to receive 55 votes in favor of it. Ooh. Raise expectations. Work stoppages, industrial sabotage, wanton property damage. Japanese Consul General Takashima Masuo threw down three separate folders under the coffee table separating him from Marita Keo and Lee Kishing. None of this is pleasant reading for Tokyo, you understand. Now, that's the Foreign Ministry's opinion, General Nagano Shigeto added, his expression barely hiding a snow under his khaki uniform side collar, but I'm sure you can imagine how the army is reacting. The atmosphere in the Consul General's office was rigid, with Consul General Takashima's disapproval pairing seamlessly with General Nagano's wilting disdain. Murray felt a slight sweat form on his palms and his brow, but it resisted the urge to wipe it even away a drop of it. The situation is proving more challenging than expected, Morita said, parsing his words carefully. We retain full confidence in the ability of the local police to manage the situation, that the protest groups can be separated and dealt with separately. Tokyo certainly hopes so, Nagano replied, despite everything going on elsewhere in the sphere. I have ordered the army garrison to remain at a heightened alert. At that, everybody, including the Consul General, shot a surprised glance at General Nagano, whose expression of disdain remained unchanged. Murita heard his own breathing sharpen involuntarily. He saw Lee gripping the arms of his chair tightly, his knuckles shaking faintly against the polished wood. Stability is in the interest of both Tokyo and her investors, Consul General Takashima interjected, shooting a point of glare at General Nagano. For, so for all of our sakes, you just need to get this under control. God dang it, let's vote! <clears throat> So, we get more institution support, less Japanese expat support, increases China's opinion, heavily decreases Hitachi's Lego seats and Japan's approval. We'll probably get to be better, increase the costs. Uh, the apology will be added to our sort of laws. Restitution to the GFT will be added. GFT compact will be added. State Ombudsman also will be added. Can we just vote now? Dossier Wang Zhang Wu. Dig deeper into the military history. Service. Unlike so many of his fellow contemporaries, Wang Ji who had a military record that was mostly still intact. The record of a survivor, aligned as he was with He Ying Ken, one of the last power brokers that affected the Xinhua government in the war's final years. 
The demobilization of the RGCO's armed forces following the end of the hostilities and the final defeat of the Qiang regime at Spared Wang, as a result likely of having friends in high places. With Yi Qin's relevance to the Nanjing government allowing Wang to transfer to the military intelligence in the early 50s. I brought up the possibility that Wang was perhaps not entirely in the intelligence service of his own volition, though, like any good soldier, he'd do his duties as best he could. Interesting. A spook? Nanjing's political attaché was not a man who, who liked having his time wasted. That was evident when he first arrived and snapped at one of the hapless aides in the government building. Some introduction to law enforcement activities in their jurisdictions. He was apparently well versed in the police and their duties on top of his, of his duties as an attaché. In that way, he resembled Guangdong's own internal espionage service is for too much to be clear a coincidence, especially when he served in military intelligence. It meant that Wang was a spook to be used to use common parlance, a public-facing one, but a spook nonetheless. We all choose to be here in his words, and after thought, make sure your man can keep up. A sort of dedication that made one think going into an intelligence service, rather than staying as an allied officer, was his choice. Rather than his father-in-law's, marks it of an initiative taker rather than a mere pencil pusher. Something kept to keep in mind, and security status sinuous. As of present, the state of Guangdong is interested in chaos, unheard of since the immediate period following the War of Liberation. Entire sectors of major urban uh, centers appear to have come under the way of, or sway of, dissident groups. Well, the occupied zones cannot be evenly split between the politically or oriented terrorists and criminal elements, both organized and disorganized. Momentum appears to lie in the hands of the lesser Chinese labor organizations. Disturbances have been less severe in rural areas, which is believed to be the result of poor communications infrastructure and a sparse or decreasing population. Despite these pressing concerns, the actions of the chief executive do not appear to match the severity of the situation. Despite the obvious economic and social detriment caused by the continued interaction, and thus the legitimacy of the Guangdong itself, they are so far from being unable or unwilling to resolve the situation correctly. Domestic security personnel, with assistance from the Camp Ai Tai, while currently able to contain the significant spread of urban violence, have thus far proven inadequate to breach and neutralize centers of unrest. Heavy assistance is requested. Communications with Tokyo and the IGA High Command have thus far proven sporadic. While agreeing with local command on the severity of the situation, they continue to invest powers of suppression within Guangdong civilian institutions. Uh, another protest has been issued, but present orders uh, remain to observe and await further instructions. Imperial 23rd Army Department of Communications. For when you're desperate. Uh, oh, dossier? Yeah. Almost involuntarily, Morita Akeo rubbed his eyes again, realizing after that he'd done it for the second time in three minutes. How many weeks had it been since he last had a proper night rest? He glanced at the clock table. <coughs> oh, look at that. Beautiful. Much better. Um, uh, uh, he glanced at the clock table. It was 4 a.m. In the dead of night, and the entire city Koshi was fast asleep. In truth, he hadn't noticed it was a slave. From the noise, he could just tell that the organ negotiations and then a formal boat counting were just as frenzied as they when they had begun in the morning. But the days were fluttering by quickly. Too quickly, there soon would be time to vote on the proposal. Despite the government's best efforts, there were still many recalcitrants in the Leco. The vote could come well down to the wire, and old age idea came to the front of the chief executive's mind. To be precise, there were two potential solutions to the problem. There was always the option to twist people's arms. The government could, with more of a bit of pressure, strong arm the bill's opponents into voting for it instead. Others could be convinced by T-Money, provided the government that was willing to provide enough of it. Given the stakes, however, the cost of taking either option would be nothing short of extortionate. Not to mention that this would essentially supercharge corruption in Guangdong. Murder Kao upon the options in front of him. Yes, it was exorbitant, but the government might need to have to bite the bullet and take it. Whatever it takes. Holy crap. Work. Relations between Guangdong's local security forces and those of the Nanjing government were professional at best and quite often never reached that level. Cooperation between the two had been for sporadic at best, with Jab security services often be drafted as mediators and go-betweens, given the general mistrust between Koshu and Nanjing. It was the same story throughout the sphere. Tokyo was the only one who could keep everyone in line, if only because they could force everyone into compliance. Cooperation between the GFP and the Republic focused on cross-border activities. Smuggling and trafficking, murders and organized crime, in other words, enough to keep even the most well-funded security service occupied and more than sufficient to keep overwork the OGPF. Fundamentally, there was too much noise to say whether Wang has, has or hasn't done anything to change the situation in his role in the riots as a separate matter entirely. A missing piece? Raise a black flag. <coughs> Since the beginning of the demonstrations, we have enacted a policy of tolerance towards the demonstrators. The protesters are already encouraged, encouraged or, to engage in peaceful acts of demonstration instead of violence, and we've had hoped that the situation would not escalate any further. We've been proven wrong, though. The protesters have started to become more violent and destructive, far exceeding what we or our investors consider the limit. More and more destruction and disruption have erupted on the streets of Guangdong, and the country is inching closer and anarchy for every second it is not addressed. Enough is enough. We, they've been warned, and yet they remain ignorant. Bring out the tear gas, raise the black flags. Guangdong must be saved from these vandals. Screen public transport. No, it's this one. Daylight raids. Despite all the efforts by security forces to quietly and carefully suppress the radicals that have thrown Guangdong into chaos, we must now attempt a policy of deterrence. Daylight raids and investigations and hotspots of radical activity must, will be approved, both to arrest as many of the subversives as we can, as well as show to the people that we will not tolerate revolutionaries in our midst. Let's turn the red flags in Wang's record. Signs that Nanjing's attaché was operating in service of some other agenda and was working clandestinely to carry it out. 
Maybe even in league with his old Guangxi, but the la rocked a real smoking gun. There was a plausible explanation for everything, and the last thing Guangdong needed was a diplomatic spat involving both the RGOC's political attaché and he King 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 Kin's son-in-law. Something to keep in mind, at least. Can we? We should have been able to smelt one by now. Come on. The council approves. A small mean, small man, some executive from Rita Chaos Company who had been granted the right to tally, walked up to the podium in the center of the council floor. He stood at the podium, watching the crowd of executives and waiting for them to be quiet. Finally, give a short statement into the microphone. The vote passes. The negotiations with the dissidents can now be put into effect. The conversation crashed to a halt across the room as each man considered the weight of his moment. For, um, for those who had pushed forth the agreement, there could be celebrations later. For those who fought back, seething and fuming, for, for the moment, the room could be united in shock. As the moment set in, the initial shock gave way to a quiet concern, a jittery contemplation of what might come next. The news thus far had only gone as far as the room. Soon it would make its way through Guangdong and beyond, beholden to the judgment of every executive officer, general, or worker. And most importantly, every protester who pledged themselves to the other protester group. The world would soon react to the news, and the world was rarely kind. Uh, Guangdong, a shot in the dark, is still a shot. Nice. So that doesn't dismantle them, does it? Find the police against the GFT. <coughs> so, this should be done, right? Or does that not do anything? Front ill intent to malicious uh, actions. At first glance, the motive for any Chinese interference in Guangdong is self evident. The Republic of China is nearly fully accepted Guangdong's distance. Um, while Guangdong rules itself by means of Tokyo's fiat, the Chinese government has gone out of its way to belittle and snub Guangdong in every official way that matters. Bureaucratic delays, diplomatic snobs, and a casual disdain have characterized nearly every interaction between Koshin and Nanjing. But a background story or history of resentment isn't enough to say that the Chinese are intervening now of, of all times. The Chinese have, with some encouragement from the Japanese and the local camp I have been begrudging have been grudging economic and intelligence partners with Guangdong for over a decade. We're gonna assume that the Chinese have always been spying on us, but to cross the line due to direct action, under the nose of the Japanese, there had to be some catalyst, some stage directions for transforming their ill intent into active disruption, even if obscured behind coded language and misleading actions, of course. Getting your hands on these messages and fully understanding these activities would mean breaching the diplomatic privileges enjoyed by the Chinese Consulate General. The uh, police proposed two courses of action. Intercept the Consulate General's direct transmissions with Nanjing or their missus sent within Guangdong. Look into the conversations. What are the Consulate General doing in Guangdong itself? Track the orders. All comes from the top. Oh, I'll do that one. Those who leave, for those in the streets. Uh, news of the successful negotiations brought a weight off their shoulders. In marches across Guangdong, they shouted success from their bullhorns, broke apart, or broke from the police picket lines, took down the signs, went home. They walked away from the terrors of crackdowns and investigations and returned with a victory. Not all accepted so easily, though, for many. Uh, the terms felt too light, too minor, and too easily sidestepped to truly protect the Chinese workers. But for many, they trusted their leaders, their negotiators. They believed in what the comrades had built, or at least what it had was the best that it would be given the circumstances. No, the ranks of the dissidents did not swell with joy. Far from it. Even the happiest members were still carrying a faint concern in their hearts that they might have done a bit more. But they returned to families, to good friends, to their lives suspended by the terrors of the riots. They returned alive and safe from the hope that their next day at work might be a bit less dangerous. And a belief that Guangdong might have grown a hair fairer. Oh. The increased rider strength increased, as well as rider increase, because we dealt with the GFT, the CCL's strength and radicalism ticks have increased. Every own state increased government control. Decreased government despair by 60%. Nice. Japanese concerns are growing. And more political power. So which is government despair? Sense of fear is panic is widespread. So that's the one. Numbers are fi finally dwindling. Pacified. Okay. That took way too long to do that one. We can negotiate with these guys. Push it through the legislative council to stop their involvement in the riots. Let me try that. Cutting a deal. Well, if it ends the riots. Um. Uh, did I read this one before? Yeah. So what do we want to do? Apologize? Individual accountability? Restitution? Increased radicalism, huh? We'll do both. For chain. Independent arms Budsman. We'll go on six. The olive branch. English rising. Japanese control is very high. Decreases government control. Decreases ooh, decreases growth. This was actually pretty good to do so. Strike, logistics hubs. Decrease the strength, decrease Japanese stuff. Deploy anti CCL riot police. Address legislative council. Honestly, that's fine for now. If I knew about this, 
Yeah, I don't want to piss off the Japanese too much. Anger's rising. Look at that. Nice. So, on here, 72, 71, 67, 52. It's not bad. We can increase this even further to maximize it. And that would give us... Yeah, we'll probably want to maximize it. The Fruitless Tail Trail. The following text is a confidential excerpt of an official report from the Guangdong Police Force. Do not share without unauthorized permission. The suspect, Guang Jingwu, Han Chinese male, approximately in his 50s, operates as a political attaché from the Republic of China. Within the city of Guangdong, heavy police surveillance over the course of several weeks have revealed a sting string of repeated movements conducted on a daily basis by the suspect. Though originally raising suspicion, these movements have been determined to be simply professional-related uh, visits to the various minor officials, civil servants, and foreign representatives from within the co-prosperity sphere. The suspect does not seem to engage in any kind of dubious activity or go on any unusual breaks from his cyclical visits occasionally. He purchases a variety of newspapers from a roadside kiosk and spends up to 30 minutes sifting through them before leaving. This behavior has been deemed to not be conspicuous and results purely from leisure. As such, monitoring the suspect's whereabouts has ceased indefinitely as the time resources could be spent elsewhere. At the end of a few weeks after, after a few weeks of silence, the Guangdong police has uh, declared suspect Jing Wei, Jing, Wang Jingwu free of any guilt or sedition or underground illicit activities. He has to be guilty. We, uh, we just have to find it. I don't know, man. There must be more. We just have to find it. We can try it. Why not? The start of something new. There wasn't much do to do for the chief negotiator, Agarshi, and his team other than to wait anxiously. Even when the protesters' delegation indicated their willingness to return to the table, it was so remarkably nerve wracking. Uh, but the first thing Igarashi noticed when he saw the protesters' representatives again was that there were fewer of them than before. Between a quarter to a third of the members in return, seemingly upset at what it was unclear. When the meeting began, the leader read from one of the clearly prepared script. Igarashi was prepared for the worst. After extensive consultations with our leaders and grassroots, we were prepared to make a decision. Based on what we have seen, our movement has decided to accept the government's proposal, he said, and the entire government negotiating team immediately relaxed, letting out breath they didn't even know they were holding. Some couldn't even resist cracking a smile. Others began thinking of how they would celebrate later that night, probably with copious amounts of alcohol, but the protesters' leader wasn't interested in letting them relax, as the next words were stern, deliberate, unsmiling. Do not think that this is the end. Talk is cheap. We've had enough of your empty, unfulfilled promises. We expect concrete, tangible action to be taken by the government. It's time to put your money where your mouth is. And that had to be up to the leg cup, Igarashi thought. That would be the only way to convince them that we mean that what we say. But this is a good start, at least. A show of force. The protesters felt joyful as they marched down the road. The streets were filled with people, a number was given each marcher a swell strength. Protest chants and sh shouted slogans rose from dozens of throats, echoing and reverberating across the looming tenement blocks. The march was aimed at a police precinct, with the march's organizers hoping that the blockade in the building would aid their allies across the city. Only a single major thoroughfare remained between the march and the target, when the fam familiar sound of sirens dashed up of every protester on the street. Police car after police car came into view, blocking the road and beginning to disgorge a veritable horde of officers. Brandishing batons, the authorities' challenge to the march was obvious to the human tide of protesters halted. <clears throat> Cowards, pigs, lapdogs, a few rocks followed the insults, clattering against shields and helmets. The police remained impassive, as a loudspeaker boomed commands for the crowd to disperse and return home, simply by the power of repetition. The booming monotone began to flatten the people's spirits. The protesters were at an impasse, lacking the numbers of force their way through the intersection and past the police. The leaders of the march decided uh, that discretion would be a better part of valor. Perhaps there reason more people would hit the streets as the day went on, and so the crowd stood and waited and waited, tension growing between them and the police line, yet few others did join, certainly not enough to make forcing the police line an option. Counterattack. Lam Xu Chung, a Zhu Jin officer worker protesting in Hong Kong, was filled with the usual protesters' zeal facing the usual pl police blockade with a typically large, typically angry group of protesters in front of the customary major police barricade. <coughs> As was the norm, the policemen were blocking them from advancing down the thoroughfare once known as Not Thin Road. Blaring the uh, regular warnings is always the case. By decree of the chief executive, citizens are hereby ordered to disperse. We have issued warnings twice already and now are making clear that any further advancement will be tolerated and so on. Obviously, this was all hot air. The protesters thought, as always, until something changed, a line of officers donned gas masks and raised a black flag over their heads. This meant warning tear smoke, but the meaning became plain clear soon enough. All normalcy dissipated as tear cancer soared over the group, stood amongst them, and then nobody cared much about anything else at all. Those remain. Uh, though for the remaining protesters, there was no easy joy upon the news of the successful negotiations, and the marches around, around Guangdong. <coughs> the watchers of former allies shouted success from their bullhorns, broke from the picket lines, and took down their signs and went home. They left their allies out in the cold to follow their path or perish. Those remained in the streets did not falter. They were not excited by the newfound agreement. They were horrified in their eyes. The protesters had given up for mere trinkets and offices. A question was left on the tongue of every protester. Had their allies always aimed to force themselves into the machines of Guangdong, or had they grown so demented that it seemed that there's no other way? and the encampments on the streets of Koshu, and in their homes in the outskirts of the state. The protesters cursed old friends and laid salt to their path. They were not heirs their allies have. 
there'd be no second negotiation. So unless the rule itself was overturned. Guangdong will not be tamed twice over. <clears throat> and we want to wait for this one because it also decreased government despair and decreased uh, strength and radicalism and increased government support too. Status, uh, uh, security status chaotic. The city of Guangdong continues to display little signs of improvement and is in many respects actively deteriorating. Despite our advice, the chief executive continues to be unable to produce lines or results in line with a pan-Asian project within Guangdong or is a pursuing goals outside the established understanding of said project. An urgent clarification of aims and policies is firmly recommended. It admits political confusion emanating from the government complex. Guangdong's domestic security, security services have proven increasingly unable to contain the swell of unrest, which, as of writing, is overwhelming more sectors of the three pros by the day. Camp Pai Command has repeatedly contacted the 104th Division for assistance, claiming that the Guangdong police force has proven too unreliable with which to operate effectively. Well, orders from Tokyo prevent IJA personnel from confirming this hypothesis. It's confirmed that the GPF are proving woefully inadequate as a peacekeeping force, particularly regarding discipline. Zhujian officers in particular appear to be a particular focus of hate for the riders, and their presence may exacerbate violence more than preventing it. Swift use of a discipline, a majority Japanese fighting force to quell unrest is recommended. While orders from Tokyo remain to stand firm, growing concerns regarding the efficacy of Guangdong's current civilian leadership. As more and more productive centers fall upon or under right under control, the economies or economic benefits Guangdong offers at the cost of security have become increasingly fleeting. As such, Prime Minister reportedly believes that the long-term sustainability and legitimacy of the state of Guangdong may have ceased to exist. Should the Prime Minister choose to confirm these sentiments, the 23rd Army is prepared to agree in the strongest possible manner. Uh, Imperial 23rd Army Department of Communications. As we have daylight raids, don't look at the poverty rate, please. Please don't look at that. And then, uh, a screen public transport. <coughs> uh, most of the demonstrators uh, cannot afford their own means of transport, and it just so happens that we, we ourselves, provide the means of gathering those for these troublemakers. Public transportation systems have been observed to be utilized by demonstrators looking to either reach their intended protest location or organize with their fellow demonstrators. Services such as public buses and train systems have been reported to carry passengers possessing questionable gears with them. To prevent them from gathering strength or further organizing, we'll take measures to screen the public transportation system. Anyone carrying stones, homemade explosives, or anything that may be used to disrupt peace in the streets shall be detained before they can group up with the masses, divide and conquer. <clears throat> Increase governance of control and decrease government despair as well as CCL strength, but increases radicalism, which is not great, but whatever. Uh, some comments include, hmm, Now that you've dealt with the effects of the oil crisis, the foundations have arrived, the Guangdong riots. And my god, they're going crazy. This is where you have to be extremely careful. Each of the focuses will influence which ending you'll get in either two failure endings or the successful ending. If you fail and lose control of the riots, the IJA will coup the government and ending the concept of Guangdong as a nation and turn into a glorified IJA stronghold. <clears throat> And someone says, I hope you won't mess, mess, mess this up, mate, because failure is not an option. And someone says, oh, no, 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 no. Should have gone with Hitachi. Or even Fujitsu. Yeah, that would have been uh, a different one. Uh, let's see. So we got rid of those, which is good. Only 29% strength. Let me keep them uh, below how much. We're looking decent here. Also, I did go back and make sure that we... Uh, did not investigate China, because that kind of screwed us up a little bit, so. Even more, that'd be nice. The most important week. Look, do you not understand how important this is? I know it's difficult, but we must pass it without any cost. Unless people like you vote for it, Guangdong will collapse. <coughs> Have you even read it yet? This ain't a deal. Considering what we're giving them, we might as well be the Surrender Act. Guangdong will collapse if we take this so-called deal and not reject it. The hallways of just a buzz at the side of the legislative council were animated, but buzz with activity even before such an early hour. Many were holding well-worn paper copies of the proposal in their hands, most were engrossed in quick bar conversations with the document's contents. All of them understood the intense pressure on the council to deliver a result. Two main camps emerged, with some were critical, and the attacks came in thick and fast on every giant title. Uh, <clears throat> ranging from the somewhat skeptical to the completely apoplectic. At the same time, one could easily just find those who defended the bill as best they could get, and their numerous passionate advocates who argued for the proposal as if their lives depended upon it, which it does. When the doors of the chamber opened, a few minutes before proceedings began, the legislator filed in without a moment's hesitation, taking their seats without delay. On top of their schedules, four black blocky words, vote in ten days, the upcoming vote would be one of the most important in their lives, if not the most important, and they have less than two weeks to make their decisions. A barrage of questions was prepared by all lawmakers. Ready for the moment, the floor is open. There will be no time to waste. The speaker w uh, walked up to the dais, tapped the mic and said, the bills and all introduced the debate may commence. Do we really not have the votes for it? Uh, is that glitched? Um, how do we not have any votes? 1972 Economic Review. You have to 59 billion, huh? Chief uh, Executive Morita Akeo scarcely noticed the passage of the original scheduled date for the annual economic catch-up with the Japanese Consul General. Its original embellishment entry on his desk calendar completely obscured behind the scribble chaos of resolving the ongoing riots. 
The Japanese consul general called to ask about the meeting or to schedule an alternate date either. They, just like the Morita Kale, have more urgent, dangerous matters to attend to. The earning reports, fiscal projections, or growth forecasts had been, that had been prepared for the meetings and unused in the corner of the chief executive's office, gathering dust. The riots ever reached the Guangdong complex, they're all burned together. How do, how do we have no votes? Numbers are dwindling. The sinners are furious. We control the situation. It's probably because we have no control over the situation. Like, bruh. Spend the police against him, huh? For when you're desperate. <clears throat> uh, I've read this before. Buy five more Lego seats. What the heck? Daylight raids. Well, let's get this through this one. No difference. Getting organized. Oh. Looking around the basement hideout, gone wrong, cannot help but wince. Many of his compatriots were sporting nasty looking bruises on, or other signs of being battered. The place of batons, trunches, and exacted blood of 12 bruises and pain from his people. What had not been broken, however, was a group spirit. Even in the darkness of the basement, Gom could still see the shining light of defiance still burning in the protesters' eyes. We th three missing, Gom said, having conducted his head count. I doubt we'll be seeing them for some time while the police have, uh, have them lock under lock and key. But the struggle goes on. It was heartened to see the firm nods of agreement by the others in attendance. None of them wanted to admit defeat. It began passing out assignments for the next day of protest. <clears throat> It was no longer enough to simply have warm bodies in the streets as the police had escalated. So had the protesters. Now each member of the protest movement had a task to fulfill when the morning came. The largest, strongest members of the group would serve as frontline enforcers, maintaining the cohesion of protesters and hunting the abuses of the police. Others would simply serve as supply runners, bringing water, medical supplies, food, and megaphones wherever they were needed. Finally, a few would serve as medics, binding up the wounds of their comrades and doing their best to ameliorate the police's brutality. The rose distributed. The group bade one another farewell, exit the basement, and disappeared in the evening night. Guangdong's twilight continues. Will the pearls darken further? Does that help us at all? No, it does not. <coughs> Remove the limiters. Just as we were thinking about the situation, could not deter it even further. We received more and more reports from the streets of anarchy and destruction. It seemed that our previous measures were not enough to deter the protesters from intensifying, and instead the protests have even amplified in intensity. There's no work yet; the people are not satisfied. Even worse, software investors in the Tokyo government started to demand results of the escalation. Of the situation, we have little to nothing to show for that regard. Circumstances are desperate, and desperate times call for desperate measures. Anything that we might be holding back from doing in the past, we do today. Limiters must be removed, and the streets must be pacified by enemies necessary. No difference. You said goodbye to our partner, uh, Chan, as, she, as he left their home in the city once known as Xiao Gawan. He said he was going to a meeting of the local martial arts groups, but he knew what was really going on. He was headed to a daytime protest of the Committee of Chinese Labor. Not that y'all minded, of course. She was not the one to carry water for the dude chief executive over in Guangzhou. One of the things that held the relationship together was Yao and Chan's mutual adm admiration for and support of the CCL's goals. As Yao said about her day, she noted that she couldn't expect Chan to be back until evening. Of course, she, that was hardly a problem as such, seeing as so everyone there by knew, knew by now that nothing dangerous really happened during the daytime hours. We support the CCL, but we aren't on the front lines, say Guangzhou, so we're probably safe, she said. And this was not a coping mechanism, but a realistic understanding of the situation. It was a shame that circumstances would change that understanding within hours. And Nu Chan came back, tripping over his own feet, breathing raggedly with his clothes torn. Yao took one look at him and turned pale. The first question was, uh, what? The police, Chan's panic answer cut her off. Already, already a warning sign. Chan had, had cut her off unless something was very wrong, and worse yet, he kept babbling. They came after they got the warehouse, I really got bar I barely got away. Yao nodded and gave Chan a hug. Well, if you got away, there's nothing else for it. Let me get you some freshened up. Chan willingly hugged it in his partner, partner's arms. When an insistent knock began at the door, the shots of police were distinctly audible. There's no difference between day and night now. Let's see, what happens when we fail this? An abject failure. <coughs> With the vote, the before the vote was finished, the echo was already in complete pandemonium. All across the floor was a clamor of voices, loud and irate and elastic, all at once, rising to fill the entire hall. They all agreed this was an absolute disaster. They disagreed on who exactly was responsible for it. A middle-aged man confronted an older counterpart, marching up close to his face. You have to hand it imbeciles, he said. What were you thinking? This was our chance, our only chance, and we blew it because people like you had to vote it down for the sake of your egos. Have you no shame? How would you could be so foolish? People like you are now the reason why Guangdong remain in flames. Pa, the old man said. What nonsense. If there's anyone responsible for this failure, it's wide-eyed ideals like you and the chief executive who fell over yourselves trying to give the rabble everything on their wish list. Now, fully red right in the face, he spat those words out of the middle-aged man. This proposal was a disgrace to Guangdong, a disgrace to the legislative council, and you should be grateful that we stopped you from further destroying our society. As the chaos continued, more to the chaos here, blankly in the distance. Undoubtedly, such much had gone wrong. He'd have time to think about that later, away from the ruckus of the present moment. For now, a single thought dominated his mind, one that he couldn't quite shake. All those negotiations and nothing to show for it. Well, that sucks. Uh, but I think I'm going to end it here. 
I'm going to, have to rethink about how we're doing this. Um, they're very radical, but the numbers are actually going down, which is actually pretty good for us. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time uh, with us trying to get this done and seeing what the best options are for us over all. Oh, but if you enjoyed the video, though, and I apologize to end it here, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow as we'll hopefully maybe even end the campaign. Thanks for watching. Have a great Guangdong riot-burning rest of your day.